Good morning, Sixth Avenue Baptist Church. To Reverend Cantalo, Reverend Morris, Reverend Spicer, and the Sixth Avenue Baptist Church family, I would like to take this moment to say thank you for blessing me with the opportunity to represent Sixth Avenue Baptist Church at the Hampton University Ministers Conference and Choir Gears and Organists Workshop 2019. Along with Ms. Gladys Williams, who also was instrumental in my attendance, it was a wonderful and blessed week of intense learning of anthems, hymns, choral, and spiritual selections. The Evelyn S. Hardy Men of the Sixth Mayor Chorus will render three of those selections from the workshop this morning. An original piece, The Glory He Deserves, a hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, an arrangement of Kirk Franklin's Joy. Reverend Cantalo, if there is a moment of fellowship, we request that it follows the special arrangement of Joyful, Joyful.
Jesus, you brought me all the way.
I haven't done this in a while. Good morning, family. Good morning. Good morning. If I could, I just want to speak openly just for a few seconds, for a few moments. Um, what you see is a collection of alumni, former members, and current members. And what today is, a, is about is sort of about a rebirth of the, of the ministry. Um, over the past year or so, I have been concerned, and some of the other alumni, former members or former leaders, uh, were concerned with the state of the ministry, just to be honest. And so, I had to realize, I had to put my pride to the side and realize that the answer wasn't going to come from just me. So I started to reach out um, to, like I said, mom, my mom, TJ, Jerry, Fred, Nick, Carson, just other people who have been involved with the ministry for so long to see what we could do. And I finally sat down with uh, Miss Letitia not too long ago, and she came up with an idea uh, to bring everybody back into the fold. So uh, we decided to reach out to all those that we could to just invite them back, to show them that this is a family. It's, it's a ministry, but it's, it's also a family. And you know how family can be sometimes. <laughs> but Regardless, it's still family, and we are always welcoming of our own. And 
Through this process, different people had different ideas of what the ministry looked like moving forward. But everybody was on one accord that it did need to move forward because we need it. The impact that it had on our lives is, is what these young men need. And so in August, because it's been a while since we've done the intake, we are going to invite new members, uh, any old members, former members, um, to come back. Uh, we will make an announcement in church once me and Jared, oh, let me introduce Jared. Jared Hicks, he is now helping me. I actually have, yeah. <laughs> Jared had decided to come back and carry this load with me, along with other alumni who will be coming in from time to time. But we decide we will sit down and give you all dates, give you all information, uh, who to contact. But uh, we will be doing a new intake in August. And this is just like the kickoff for the rebirth. Uh, we thank you for our time. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, well, well. All right. Well, they came out today, didn't they? Now, tell somebody to go buff this flow. No. <laughs> oh, no, that was a lot of energy, man. And uh, it's good to see them coalescing and uh, coming back. Praise the Lord. And
my soul. It's just so sweet. Soul saving. You got to hold on to it. It's hard to see. That's where faith comes in. <laughs> Doctor in the sick room. <laughs> He's the lily of the valley. The lily. <laughs> My master.
my, my, my. Ooh. He arose. He arose. I'd rise too with all that rocking. I'd rise. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. He arose. I want to thank uh, the male chorus under the direction of Vedrick Shelby. We want to thank them uh, for leading us uh, in worship today. You know, as I kind of reflect on uh, the young man who stepped, it was somewhat humorous to me, you know, to see a, a man in his 20s talking about you have to catch his breath, you know. I uh, see, you see, it happens to all of us once you get out of doing something, man, it's something else. But, but they did a wonderful job. I want to thank all of those who were involved. And um, I want to thank you, my brothers and sisters, for the spirit that you bring to worship. That's so very important. I don't care what goes on necessarily up here. If we all get involved in worshiping our Lord, you see, uh, then the atmosphere will uh, be uplifted and charged with the Spirit of God. But, but in a sense, you have to get involved as well. Well, my brothers and sisters, I want you to praise the Lord. Amen. I want you to turn to your Bibles to uh, Psalm 103. Uh, I'm going to look at uh, the New King James Version. It's going to be there on the screen, Psalm 103. And then we're going to take a look at uh, 1 Thessalonians, uh, uh, the fifth chapter. Verses 16 through 18. Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5, and then 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, verses 16 through 18. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's, let's read this one all together. It is, as, as up there on the screen, it is a psalm of David. Let's read this, this psalm all together. All right. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Keep going. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his what benefits, all right? Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, verse 5, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Praise the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Now, 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, reads, Rejoice always. Pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Let's go back over that one more time, Kathy. All right? Rejoice, what did it say? Evermore. All right? Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. May the Lord bless the hearing and the reading of his holy word. Uh, let the people of God uh, say amen. 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 Eternal God, our Father, uh, once again, Lord, we are gathered here uh, for the hearing, the proclamation, the teaching, and the sharing of your word. Uh, may I simultaneously be the speaker as well as the listener. And I just pray, Lord, you take this weak vessel and use it to speak to your people. I certainly pray that their hearts and their minds might be open to receive your word, what thus saith the Lord. And even as Moses ascended on the mountain, and when he got there, he recognized your awesome presence. He bowed down before you. He took off his shoes in humility. Likewise, Lord, as Moses did, we ask that you would speak to us. We bow down in humility, and we ask that you would speak to us in the name of Jesus. Uh, let the church say amen. 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 The subject of our sharing uh, this morning is, before you speak, remember God's goodness to you. Before you speak, remember God's goodness to you. I, I want to explain our text today by giving you two examples or two illustrations, very well-known illustrations uh, from the New Testament. I'm going to start with the first one. In John, uh, the eighth chapter, 
It tells us that at the dawn of a new day, Jesus appeared in the temple courts. And when the crowds saw him, they all began to gather around him. And it says that Jesus, as typical during that day, he sat down and began to teach them. And while he was teaching, it says that the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, they brought in a woman caught in adultery. And they said to him while he was teaching, they interrupted what he was doing. They said, teacher, we, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. Now, the law of Moses said that such women should be stoned. But what do you say? Now, now they said that because they wanted to trap Jesus. And the Bible says that at that point, Jesus, who was previously sitting, it says that he bent down, all right, and he began to write in the dirt. And they kept questioning him. They kept asking him, Lord, what do you say? The law says that we should stone such a woman. Then finally it says that, that Jesus straightened up and he looked at him and he said, whoever among you is without sin, uh, you throw a stone at her first. And then he stooped back down and began to write on the ground. Now, some people speculate that he was writing down the sins of the ones who were ready to stone this woman. Now, now I disagree because Jesus would not have known all, uh, the sins of every one of them. And besides that, you've got to understand that Jesus was not functioning as God, but the Bible says when he came here, he functioned as a man. He poured out his divinity, and he acted and did all of the things that only a man can do. And it's really not important what he wrote on the ground, is it? But it's important what he said. And the scripture says that one by one, after he told them he was out sin, why don't you throw a stone at her first? The scripture says that one by one, all of the men dropped their stones and they began to leave, beginning with the oldest. Right now, ain't that something? When they had all had gone, when they had all gone, Jesus, the Bible said, straightened up and he asked the woman, he said, Woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. He says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. The NIV version says, go and leave your life of sin. Now, now that is, no matter how you look at it, that is a powerful story to say the least. To say the least. And I think it's powerful because all of us know, all of us know that there is something that we have done that we were not punished for. All of us have done something that we were not punished for. And many of us to this day, we carry around our guilt. Uh, we carry around shame. We carry around this sense of condemnation. But this account right here teaches us that there is someone who can absolve us of our sins. There is someone who can set us free from all of our guilt, from all of our condemnation, and his name is Jesus. Now, think about this now. Really focus in on what was going to happen now. It's so very different from our day. These men, they were about to kill this woman. They were about to stone this woman for being caught in the act of adultery. Now, now granted, they were just trying to use her to get at Jesus. She was a guinea pig. But can you imagine if Jesus said, you are absolutely right? The law does say that. This woman should be stoned. I believe with their mob mentality, they would have gone to start pelting stones at her right then and there. Isn't that something? They were going to kill her. It's amazing. In their day and time, they knew sin was serious in the sight of God. Now, many times we don't necessarily capture that when we talk about the gospel today. But sin was very serious in the sight of God. But somehow... These men forgot that they had done some things too. How did they forget? How did they forget that they were not innocent themselves? How did they forget that they had done things in secret they just did not get caught? How did they forget those things, huh? They forgot. You know why they forgot? They forgot because they were not thankful for what God had done for them. And so they were of the mindset that they were not going to tolerate this foolishness from this woman. They were probably thinking if this woman gets away with it, 
then all of the women will get away with it and we'll have a problem on our hands. We might as well nip this in the bud right now. So they said to Jesus, the law of Moses said such women should be sown. But what do you say, Jesus? Now, before they spoke, they should have remembered the mercy and the goodness and the grace that God had shown them. Before you speak, remember what God has done for you. Now, there's another story in Luke, the seventh chapter, about another woman. But now, let's just suppose that this woman in Luke chapter 7 is the same woman in John chapter 8. Because we really don't know what happened to this woman. We don't know what she did after Jesus said, go and leave your life of sin. Go and sin no more. We just know that Jesus said to her, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. So, so let's just speculate. Let's suppose this woman I'm about to talk about in Luke chapter 7 is the same one that Jesus freed from condemnation in John chapter 8. So in Luke chapter 7, the Bible tells us that Jesus uh, was invited uh, to the house of a man named Simon, and he was a Pharisee. And it says that as Jesus was reclining at the table, now in those days the tables were very low, he wasn't sitting down, but he was on a pillow, and his feet were probably stretched out. As he was reclining at the table, it says that a woman uh, with an alabaster jar of perfume, she comes in and she stands behind Jesus. Then it says she, she begins to weep. I imagine she begins to weep uncontrollably. Apparently, she bent down, and it says that as she begins to weep, her tears, they fell on Jesus' feet. And then she begins to wipe his feet with her hair. And then she begins to kiss his feet. And then she pours perfume on his feet. Now, when the host Simon sees this, he says, you know, I imagine those who were sitting close to him, he says, listen, let me tell you something. This man can't possibly be a prophet because if he was, then he would know what kind or what manner of woman this is who is touching him. And Jesus immediately, he perceived in the spirit, or perhaps he heard him. He, 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 he said something to something. He said, he, said, he said, Simon, I have something to tell you. And Simon said, tell me, teacher. He said, two people owed money to a money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, and one owed him 50 denarii. Now, a denarii is a day's worth of wages. So he said, the money lender, so he said, one owed the money lender 500 days worth of wages, and the other owed him 50 days worth of wages. Now, neither one of them could pay him back, and so the money lender decided to forgive both men of their debts. Then Jesus asked him, he said, Simon, which one do you think will love the money lender more? Simon said, I suppose the one who owed him more. Jesus said, you are correct. He said, do you see this woman? He said, you did not give me any water for my feet, which was customary during that time, but this woman has wet and washed my feet with her tears. You didn't give me a kiss, which was customary Middle Eastern greeting at that time, but he said, this woman has not ceased the moment that I walk in your house to give me to kiss my feet. He said, you did not pour oil on my head, which was customary. He said, but this woman has anointed my feet with her perfume. He says, therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven as her great love has shown. He says, but whoever has been forgiven little, that was his dig at Simon. Whoever has been forgiven little, he said, loves little. And then Jesus said to the woman, he said, woman, your sins are forgiven you. And then the other guests, they began to ask themselves and say to them, who is this? Or better yet, they were really saying, who does this man think he is? 
that he is able to forgive someone's sins. Now, the reason that Simon was critical in a negative way of Jesus, and the reason he was critical of this woman was because he got caught up in what he thought was and was not appropriate in a public setting. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, we, we get caught up like that sometimes. What is and is not appropriate. And so we're so worried about what everybody else thinks that sometimes we forget to focus on what God thinks, right? He was so caught up in that, so much so that he was desensitized to what was really happening right in front of his face. And he was critical. Why? Because just like those men in John chapter 8, he was not a grateful person, right? He had somewhere along the way forgotten what God had done for him. And his lack of gratitude was shown in that he was, the Bible says he was, Jesus said, a very poor host. In that time, he lacked the basic skills of hospitality that he should have shown to any guest. He gave Jesus no water for his feet, even though Jesus had been walking the dusty roads of Palestine, and any time you entered a person's house, they would offer you water for your feet to cleanse them. He gave Jesus no customary greeting like they do in the Middle East. You know how they give you two kisses, one on, one on each side. He gave Jesus no kiss, all right? He gave Jesus no oil for his head that he might be refreshed from the heat of the day. Basic acts of hospitality during his day, Simon did not show our Lord, who to him was just another man. Why? Because he was not grateful. See, Simon, when he was looking at Jesus and his woman, he didn't think about how God had spared him. He didn't think about how God had forgiven him. He didn't think about how God had been kind to him, and because he forgot that, he said to those around him, this man can't possibly be a prophet. Why? Because if he were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this was who is touching him. Before you speak, my brothers and sisters, critically about someone else, I want you to pause, and I want you to take a deep breath. Before you say something, before you open your mouth, Remember the goodness and the grace and the mercy that God has shown you before you throw somebody under the bus. <laughs> Man, folk are quick to do that right there, boy. Before you throw somebody under the bus, you got to ask yourself, how has God been good to me? Now, I'm going to tell you this. You will not remember to do this. You will not remember to do this if you have not been touched by the Lord in a way in that you have received him. Huh? huh? Now, get what I'm saying. I believe the Lord has touched everybody in this room. I believe the Lord has spoken to everyone in this room. I believe that he has helped you. I believe that he has protected you. I believe that he has sustained you. I believe that he has provided for you. But you may not have received it as being from him. You may even think that you were deserving of all of the blessings that you have. You know, one of the things that concerns me today is that many times people in general, I mean, when you look at from whence we have come as a people, so many of us think that we deserve something. We think that we ought to be treated like king, but that is not necessarily the case. It doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. The psalmist now, let's look at the text. Psalm 103, the one that I started with. Psalmist said, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, he says, and do not forget all of his benefits. Huh? Uh, uh, the psalmist says, don't forget, in other words what the Lord has done for you. Don't forget the benefits 
of knowing God. Call to mind, remember the blessings of being in relationship with God. Don't forget his goodness. Don't forget his mercy. Don't forget his provision for you. Look at what the text says. The text says, it says, here is one of the benefits. Don't forget his benefits. One of his benefits, it says, is that he forgives all of your iniquities. It doesn't say he forgives some of them, but it says that he forgives what? All of your iniquities. Now, people may not forgive you. That's the truth. People are going to hold some things against you. Sometimes you may do some things that in their mind they will never, forever forget. And they'll hold that against you. But the Bible says that God forgives it all if you truly come to him and ask him for forgiveness. You know, the Bible says, listen, over and over and over again, the word of God says that his mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. It says that his mercy endures forever. The psalmist said, as far as the east is from the west. So far has he removed our transgressions from us. But not only does it say that the Lord has forgiven us of all, or he forgives us of all our iniquity. That's one benefit. But it says also that he heals us of all of our diseases. Isn't that something? You know, in Jesus' day, they believed in healing. But they became very skeptical if someone talked about the forgiveness of sins. In our day, we believe in the forgiveness of sins, but we're not too quite sure about healing us of all of our diseases. But that's what the Scripture says. He heals us of all of our diseases. He is the source of your supply. In other words, in every single aspect of your life. And that's why, that's why in 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, that second text that I came out of, that's why Paul said, rejoice always. Isn't that something? That's what Paul is telling you to do right now. I don't know what you're going through, but Paul says, rejoice always. In other words, don't be anxious. Don't be overly concerned about what your faith, don't be ungrateful. God can work it out. Do you believe that God can work it out? If you believe that, then you have a reason right now to rejoice in the Lord. And he says not only to rejoice in the Lord, he says pray without ceasing. That's a part of what it means to give thanks, huh? You can say right now, even as I speak, or when you're driving, or while you're on your job, Lord, I want to thank you for waking me up this morning. Lord, I want to thank you for putting food on my table. Lord, I want to thank you that this sickness that I have right now in the name of Jesus shall leave because you said by your stripes I was healed. I want to thank you right now that you've given me a job. I want to thank you right now for my church family. I want to thank you right now for my, you can thank the Lord, pray without ceasing. And then that's why Paul said, in everything, you ought to give thanks. Isn't that something? In every situation, every, not for everything, but in everything, give thanks. That's why Paul said, you know, Paul said, Paul said, I have learned the secret of being content. He says, whether I have a whole lot or whether I have very little, he says, I have learned that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let's say that all together. That's, that's Philippians 4. Say, I can do, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's what, right? No matter where you are, no matter what it is you're facing, you've got to know that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. So, so, my brothers and sisters, giving thanks reminds you of what God has done for you in the past. And it reminds you that what he did in the past, God can do for you in the present. And he can do for you in the future. You know why? Because the Bible says 
that Jesus Christ is the same what? Yesterday, today, and forever. My God, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same as he was in the past, the present, and the future. Our God is the most predictable being in the universe. If God was merciful to you 20 years ago, he'll be merciful to you today. If God brought you out five years ago, he can bring you out today. Be thankful for what God has done, can do, and will do for you. And when you, and when you focus on what God has done for you, all of the other problems, they should become small. They should pale in comparison to the glory and the righteousness and the beauty and the truth and the omnipotence of our Savior. Every other thing ought to bow down in the presence. Your problems need to bow down in the presence of God. And one of the ways in which they will bow down is if you give thanks and honor and glory to the God who brought you out. He is your God. And if he's your God, you ought to declare that to be so, huh? So let me just say to you, before you speak, before you say anything, before you open your mouth, before you are critical of anybody around you in a negative way, remember what God has done for you. Remember all of his benefits unto you and remember that God has forgiven you of all, all of your iniquities. Amen. Amen. The doors of the church are open. Oh, praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. The doors of the church are open. We invite you to become a part of us. Uh, we're not a perfect church, but we're striving to be all. Uh, that God would have us to be. So when I say the doors of the church are open, I'm simply saying uh, if you don't have a church home, if you don't belong to a church, you can join this church. The prerequisite to joining every church should be that you believe that Jesus died for your sins on the cross, that he was raised from the dead by the power of God to live a life that he gives to you so that you too can live in the power and in the forgiveness of God. So we invite you to come. If you don't know the Lord, give your life to him today. Give your life to him today. If you don't know what tomorrow holds, we invite you now to come join us or to ask Jesus to come into your life to say, Lord, I have sinned against you. I have sinned against my fellow man. And I ask you right now to, to, to forgive me and come into my heart and save me. You can do that right now.